Yeah, welcome to the next session of the grammatical theory lecture. Today we will start with the first real theory, um, government and binding. This is an outline of the whole course. Uh, we already covered uh, introduction and basic terms, phrase structured grammars, and now we are at government and binding. Okay, the reading material uh, is uh, for, for that part of uh, the part of on government and binding is section 3.1. So that's the basic uh, introduction to the framework. And then we, there will be more parts on um, passive and uh, local reordering and on um, the German clause structure. Okay, so we have seen phrase structure grammars so far. Um, they going go back to uh, Bloomfield work and Chomsky was the first one to formalize them. So that was one of his um, important papers on, on properties of uh, phrase structure grammars. But then he went on and said, okay, the Phrase structure grammars as such are not uh, sufficient for capturing natural language. And he uh, suggested something that was uh, also suggested by his uh, supervisor, Zedek Harris, uh, namely to use transformations. So uh, he said, okay, if we look at sentences like an active sentence and a passive sentence, um, we can write phrase structure rules uh, for them, but that wouldn't uh, capture the, the relation between the two sentences and the nature of the phenomenon. So we can, um, if, if you look at uh, sentences with intransitive, transitive, ditransitive verbs, you can always form, um, or depending on the verb, you can form uh, a passive version uh, of, of the active sentence, but that is not captured in phrase structure grammars because they are just the rules for the active intransitive verb, uh, the passive intransitive verb, the active transitive verb, the passive transitive verb, the uh, active ditransitive and the passive ditransitive. So for all these clause types you have different rules, but um, that's according to Chomsky not what we do. Uh, as uh, humans and uh, doesn't represent our capabilities. And he said, okay, we need something to capture the re regularities uh, and that something is transformations. So this is um, what you see here, the, the little thing uh, is an example of such a transformation. It says, okay, if we have some, some tree in which an NP, a verb and an NP occurs, uh, then we can transfer the sentence into something where the, this NP labeled with three is initial, then there's a form of the auxiliary B and then the verb with some ending EN, so that's a participle ending, and some biphrase with the NP in it that was the one here. So from Kim loves Sandy, we can get Sandy is loved by Kim, why are this transformation? Um, so this is a little bit more um, readable in tree notation. So that um, if we apply that uh, transformation to this tree, we get something like this. So Kim loves Sandy, Kim is loved by Sandy. So you should note um, one property of the early transformations, uh, it's this stuff is just somewhere in the tree. So it takes an arbitrary tree and takes this NP and puts it into this PP here. This is from, from nowadays perspective, it's completely bizarre. Uh, so just, just arbitrarily transform uh, the tree into something new. And um, uh, this approach was, was dropped uh, over the years, replaced by something more restrictive. And we will learn about that uh, today. So, uh, 
I already mentioned uh, Chomsky's early work on uh, phrase structure grammar. So he uh, put different types of phrase structure grammars into classes, uh, ranging from, from type three to type zero. And he's very famous for this in computer science. Um, so the computer scientists know him uh, as well as the linguist. Uh, and this, this, these different classes are called uh, the Chomsky hierarchy um, because the, the classes correspond to computational complexity of, of computational problems related to phrase structure grammar. So three is very simple and zero is horrible. Um, the phrase structure grammars we saw so far are so-called context-free grammars. Um, so on the left-hand side of, of the uh, rewrite rule, there's just one um, element, just one category, uh, and it's independent of the context that uh, the replacement of uh, the symbols on the right happens. So the class for these uh, grammars is type two. And uh, the, the maximum level is type zero is too powerful for human languages. So that one, that was something people agreed on uh, early on, but they didn't know the exact level for quite some time. Um, but it was clear that type zero is too much and the researchers wanted to be more restrictive. Um, in the 70s, Peters and Ritchie showed that uh, if we have these general transformations where you can put anything anywhere, um, then uh, we are at the level of type zero complexity and that's horrible. So we don't want it or, well, I don't care. <laughs> HPHD people don't care, but uh, people at that time uh, cared and tried to come up with something better. Um, then um, it, there, there were problems that the transformations were not sufficiently restricted, so the interactions between transformations uh, were not tractable, uh, so nobody could keep all the possible combinations in their head. Um, and uh, there was a problem that the transformations uh, could delete material. So um, that was not recoverable um, um, from when, when you started on a surface, basically looking at, at a sentence, you would have to redo or undo all the transformations. And um, since transformations could delete stuff, you, you didn't know what to do, basically. Um, so there were revisions to the framework and a new theoretical approach uh, emerged that was government and binding, um, published by, by Chomsky in 81. And um, there were restrictions for the form of grammar rules and uh, where the um, and, and there were so-called traces. So there, there was a record uh, where the elements that were moved were coming from. And there were general principles that restricted the power of transformation. So that's the, the basic historical uh, development. And uh, we also have to, to mention the, the, well, philosophical background. So all the work in, in Chomsky and series was uh, really connected to the question of uh, language acquisition. So how uh, can we uh, acquire language? Why uh, do humans have it and other species uh, don't have it? Um, Chomsky argued that uh, some of our linguistic knowledge is innate. So we start out with uh, something uh, uh, that is genetically determined uh, and that makes, enables us to acquire language. And it's 
not really clear what is this knowledge. Um, so there have been suggestions that it's very specific, like containing information about part of speech uh, classes, um, information about morphological features and whatever, right? Um, some and and yeah and constraints on possible structures like expa theory and so on so not all linguists agree with the assumption that there is uh, innate domain specific that means just for linguistics um, uh, knowledge um, so most people working in construction grammar do not assume uh, innate linguistic knowledge and uh, the same is true for HPC and I think also for, for LFG and other uh, frameworks. So if you are interested in this discussion, uh, you may have a look at the grammar theory textbook. So there's, there, there are two parts. There's the first part where uh, individual theories are um, introduced. And then there's a general discussion part. Uh, we will not go into these general things in, in this class but um, you can uh, re, uh, follow the discussion there. So this is for advanced uh, readers that basically know um, the first part, the, the theories, and then there's this general uh, discussion how the theories connect to um, some controversial issues. Okay, so um, uh, it's assumed so in order to, to, uh, to solve that uh, language acquisition problem, it's assumed that um, there are principles that uh, all linguistic structures have to obey. So whatever language you learn, whether it's Chinese or Hindi or Russian, um, you, you know about certain principles uh, regarding language already. And um, that's supposed to help you uh, to, to derive a full grammar from the input you hear. And it's assumed that these principles are parameterized. So there is a choice um, between certain parameter settings and Chomsky uh, compared that with a switch. So, so a child sits there and uh, listens to um, his father or uh, other children and uh, thinks, hmm, that sounds like a head final uh, language, so it's Japanese or something. And it uh, switches the switch to head final rather than to head initial, so head final plus minus. Um, so and, and the idea is that it's straightforward to find these parameter setting uh, and uh, that helps language acquisition. In reality, it's not the, all these models uh, involving parameter settings are really complicated. Uh, and I think it's even more difficult uh, with, with such a parameter based learning model than uh, acquiring just stuff from the input. So um, Martin Haspelmart, a typologist, uh, one said, that's a very cool idea. If it would work, we would just have uh, to publish one page of, um, uh, of parameter settings. So we have 32 parameters. And if they have binary cho choices, we have two uh, to the power of 32. And that's a lot of languages. And you just publish the, the parameter settings, and then you know what the language is like. Um, since we don't know what the parameters are uh, until now. Uh, people have to publish grammars and they are usually 1,000 pages long. So it would be nice if, if it works. Um, until now, nobody knows what these parameters are supposed to be and uh, how grammars uh, can be acquired with these parameters. But that's a general idea, right? So the example, I should have given the example before this, uh, this discussion, but the example that, that you find in the literature is pretty cool. So if you um, uh, compare the sentences in 68, uh, be showing pictures of himself. So that's an English verb phrase. And uh, then the Japanese uh, parallel thing, 
uh, self of picture showing B, um, you see that it's the exact mirror image. And that's cool, isn't it? I mean, so, so you have the, the copula here or auxiliary here at the end, then the verb uh, uh, um, showing and a picture, which is the, to the left of uh, or the PP here, and you have something like the PP um, uh, in the opposite order here. So it's an exact mirror image. And if you see that, you think, wonderful. So it's as, as the GB people say, right? It's a parameter and for one language, all heads go to the left. And for the other language, all heads like verb, preposition and so on go to the right. Cool except that it doesn't work, not even for German. So if you take the, the next language uh, close to English, it stops working. Okay, uh, how, what, what assumptions are made for uh, the T model, for, for the basic architecture? So that, that's something that's called the T model and we want to talk about that uh, in the following. So Chomsky said um, that simple phrase structure grammars cannot capture certain regularities. So for instance, the relation between active and passive and therefore he assumes that there's an underlying structure, the so-called deep structure. And from this, uh, there is a, a surface structure uh, derived um, uh, with certain mappings, these transformations uh, we already talked about. And the, the surface structure and deep structure are not, um, well, the surface structure doesn't correspond to the pronunciation. So uh, people that, because of possible confusions, people use the terms S structure and D structure rather than surface structure and deep structure. But that's basically the, the same idea that there is a underlying structure, something where things uh, start so you have trees and then you derive uh, from these trees other trees and that the result of the derivation is called surface structure. So this is the uh, picture uh, and the overview of the T model. Um, the T model is called uh, T model because that somehow looks like a T. Uh, it's sometimes it's also called Y model. Uh, because it looks like a Y. Uh, and uh, the idea is that this D structure is licensed by uh, phrase structure rules, X bar rules plus a lexicon. Then we have move alpha, a general transformation that takes stuff and moves it to, to other positions. And by several of these movements, we arrive uh, at S structure. And there, um, there is a certain split. Uh, and it goes to the phonetic form on the one hand and logical form on the other hand. So we have uh, to go to the phonetic form. We have deletion, deletion rules, filters, and phonological rules. And for the S structure, we have uh, for, for a logical form, we have anaphoric rules, uh, rules of quantification and uh, control. We will talk about all these uh, levels uh, one by one in the next minutes. So the lexicon contains a lexical entry for every verb, word or uh, morpheme, if you uh, assume that. Um, and we have information about uh, morphological structures, syntactic features, valence uh, frames, and so on. Um, the lexicon is the interface between syntax and semantic interpretation of word forms. Um, the vocabulary is not determined by uh, UG, uh, so it's not innate. 
Uh, some people even assumed that, but it doesn't make sense because then words like uh, to Google or to or iPod or uh, Gauben should be innate, should be there in our genetically determined uh, vocabulary, and that, that just doesn't make sense. Um, so what people assume or some or many, I don't know, uh, assume is that there are structural conditions uh, on how these uh, lexical items may look like. Um, that's also not shared by all linguists. So some say that morphosyntactic features, uh, for example, gender, um, are not predetermined, but um, there is a toolbox that uh, of, of stuff that can be used uh, to build languages. And some people assume, like Schenke and Ritzi, assume that uh, there are at least 400 innate categories and they are all um, coming in a certain order. So phrase structure uh, uh, trees are always in a certain order. And that's almost certainly wrong because i mean maybe you you uh, took biology lessons in in school um if you don't read up the genetics literature there is um so if you look in the in the grammar theory textbook there uh, in the discussion there are pointers to um uh, articles by biologists uh, written for linguists so in like its trends of uh, trends in cognitive science or something like that so there's a journal that that publishes these uh, easy to understand articles and um, they explain how genetics works and um, it's very unlikely that such specific things are encoded in our genome why should they so like some African languages have 18 genders and why should I have that in my genome? So in what sense would it help me uh, in, in terms of biological evolution? So how, how could it get there and how would it be encoded in the genome? So th these are questions um, that have to be answered. And Chomsky also wrote a paper with two, uh, two biologists where he revised uh, assumptions about what is genetically determined. So it's, it's probably not specific gender features. Okay. Um, uh, the, the next thing, so we discussed the, the, the lexicon a bit. Um, the next thing is phrase structure uh, rules. So uh, we can describe relation between constituents. That's what a phrase structure rules do for us. Um, we have a certain format for, for the rules. That's uh, the XPA schema and the lexicon plus uh, structures of XPA syntax. Uh, form the D structure. The D structure is a syntactic representation of valence frames of particular words as determined in the lexicon. So if the lexicon says I need um, uh, a dative argument or an object, then the verb is combined with this uh, dative argument uh, in the D structure. We have a certain tree showing the, uh, uh, the configuration and uh, we know uh, here in this tree we have the dative object. It's at a certain position. Um, if we look at uh, the examples in 69, we see that uh, constituents can uh, be realized at different positions uh, in the clause. So the in the first sentence, we have a verb final clause, der Mann dem Kind das Buch gibt, uh, with a gibt, uh, gives uh, at the very end. And in B, we have a verb first sentence, gibt der Mann dem Kind das Buch. So that's a question. Questions are formed in, in the Germanic uh, languages, except English, by just placing the verb in initial position. And then we have uh, uh, in C, der Mann gibt dem Kind das Buch, 
uh, an example where we have one constituent fronted in front of the finite work. So there are different positions uh, of material in, in the sentence and that's uh, uh, accounted for by a transformation rule that's called move alpha and it, its effect is or what it stands for is uh, move anything anywhere. So that sounds sort of crazy and not much better than the general transformations we had before, but it's, it, is, it is more restrictive. So um, we cannot put something uh, uh, from an NP in, uh, in a PP. So there have to be positions where, where things can move to and um, that, that is much more restricted than, we, than what we had. Uh, before. Okay, um, then um, the relations between predicates and their arguments are determined by lexical entries and they th these relations have to be recoverable at all representations because of uh, semantic interpretation and the the way this is done is that the place where something originated is marked by a trace. So in our example 70, 70 is uh, that's assumed as the basic order, der Mann dem Kind das Buch gibt, and then the, the gibt is taken away here and put uh, into initial position, and we have a trace here that marks this position, right, where it's coming from. And similar, we have uh, similarly, we have the subject fronted, so it's moved from here to the initial position. Okay, um, yeah, for empty elements, there are different conventions. Sometimes people write an E, uh, an e there or a T. Uh, I use just the, the underscore. The S structure that is derived uh, via move alpha is a surface-like structure, but it's not uh, not necessarily form the form in which actual sentences appear. Um, this is done on the phonetic form, and there are certain things that can happen on the way from a, a S structure to phonetic form. So one example that is often given. is the uh, uh, so-called one construction. So uh, 71 is an example. The students want to visit Paris. That's basically um, want and then to visit Paris is an infinitival phrase. Uh, but even though they're in, in part in the syntax tree, the want and the to can fuse because they are next to each other. And um, then we get the students want to visit Paris. So the, the phonological rule, the optional rule is given in 72. Want plus two gives honor. So that's something that happens on PF. Um, on the other side of, of this uh, Y model, let's go back to, to the picture and have a look again. Yeah, so, so D structure, S structure, PF and LF. So we explained this part, the phonetic form, and now we are looking at logical form. So um, the, the logical form deals with things like um, anaphoric reference, binding and uh, quantifiers and so on. Uh, we first look at at binding. Um, so if you have a look at the sentences in 73, you will realize that the pronouns behave differently. So Peter kauft einen Tisch, er gefällt ihm. Um, you can think about what er and what ihm uh, is referring to or what they can refer to. Um, 
yeah, you may stop the presentation and, and think about that. Ea yeah, can refer, so it's masculine, it can refer to uh, Peter and uh, to uh, Tush. Uh, Im can also uh, refer to uh, Tish and also to Peter. Um, it can, both of these uh, uh, pronouns can also refer to uh, re things outside of the discourse or uh, this local context, right? So if you said something before, then uh, you may refer to uh, things you refer to before uh, with er and im. Um, if you have Peter kauft eine Tasche, er gefällt ihm, um, then the im or the er cannot refer to, to Tasche, to bag, because that's feminine. So there's a gender mismatch um, and you have to somehow uh, explain which element may uh, refer to which other element. Uh, and and take care of these language uh, these facts in, in a certain language so that there's the uh, uh, gender match between pronoun and uh, antecedent um, and in this in the third example peter kauft eine tasche er gefällt sich it's clear that the sich cannot refer to something outside of the sentence so it has to refer to er Right, and if you if you look a little bit at these um, the distribution of these pronouns, you see that there is something syntactic going on. So it's not just that you can say, okay, this is semantic. Um, they always behave like this, these pronouns. But um, you you have to uh, take the tree structure into account, and that's something that government and binding does right so they have a certain tree structure and then refer to it and uh, at the lf uh, level they talk about pronoun binding uh, another interesting thing is uh, quantification so um, the standard example is every man loves a woman um, where you have two readings so one is um, um, I, I hope everybody of you saw these symbols before. So that's uh, quant the all quantifier and then this uh, existential quantifier. And so there is, in, in the first reading, there is uh, for every man, uh, th there is some woman so that the man loves the woman, that can be different uh, women, right? So uh, everyone has to have one, but um, uh, it, it may be the same woman or different women. And uh, here the scope is different. Uh, so there is one woman and all men that are present in a certain situation uh, love that woman, right? So maybe Marilyn Monroe or whatever. Um, the the account that was or one account that was uh, suggested for for these uh, uh, quantifier scope difference this was that there is basically a syntactic structure the, the s structure um, that and and we can derive one uh, quantifier reading uh, from it and then there are other movements on LF. Uh, other transformations that uh, reorder the end piece uh, so that you get something that corresponds to the other quantifier reading. Um, the approach is not without problems, but um, this is something that people uh, suggest that uh, is done on LF. Um, another thing that is done on LF uh, is uh, so-called control theory. Um, and control deals with the question how um, the, 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 the referent of the subject of infinitives is determined. So if you look at the examples in ABC, 
Der Professor schlägt dem Studenten vor, die Klausur nochmal zu schreiben. Um, so the question is, who writes the test again? Um, or the professor, der Professor schlägt dem Studenten vor, die Klausur nicht zu bewerten. So who does not grade the uh, exam? Or der Professor schlägt dem Studenten vor, gemeinsam ins Kino zu gehen. Um, so who is going to the movies? Um, in, in, in these examples, we have various options uh, uh, how to fill that subject slot. But there are other verbs like uh, swing, like force or something, uh, where just one element can fill the subject slot. So that's something that uh, is also done at LF. Okay, so um, let's introduce some basic terminology for the lexicon. The lexicon is a very important component in, in this T model. Um, we have, uh, we somehow have to have the meaning uh, of the words in the lexicon and um, th the we have information about the combinatoric potential uh, of the words in a lexicon and uh, certain semantic roles. So something uh, like an acting person or an affected thing. An example for uh, meaning uh, representation is given in uh, 76B. Uh, that's the representation for uh, Judith beats the grandmaster. So in chess, Judith Polga won. And um, so we have like beat X, Y. And um, the, the term for that is uh, valency or selection. So th that would be, so the, the semantic predicate is selecting X and Y, that would be semantic selection. Um, it, there are cases where the semantic selection differs from syntactic selection. So you have to be careful there, but for the most uh, cases we are looking at, um, the syntactic selection is, is, is parallel to the semantic selection. Sometimes people say that the subject uh, is not syntactically selected because all um, all verbs take a subject anyway so that's outside of the syntactic selection but that's actually problematic because for instance in german uh, there are subjectless constructions and you somehow have to know that or write it down in a lexicon that uh, a verb doesn't or an adjective for that matter doesn't take a subject um, yeah, other terms uh, for this are subcategorization. Uh, beat, uh, one, one says beat is subcategorized for a subject and an object. Um, and the word subcategorized somehow developed his own, its own life. So one can say X subcategorizes for Y, um, meaning X selects Y. Yeah, beat is also called the predicate since uh, beat prime is the logical predicate. Um, subject and object are arguments of the predicate. Um, so that's a more general term, prepositional objects, whatever, the, these are called arguments. And there are several terms for selection requirements. Um, some have a more semantic uh, touch, some syntactic, some are mixed. So we have uh, the terms argument structure, valence frame, subcategorization frame, semantic grid, theta grid, or uh, written with a theta letter. Uh, adjuncts, we already talked about adjuncts in the introductory uh, lecture. They modify semantic predicates. Um, if semantic aspects are discussed, then the term modifier is used. 
and the adjuncts are not listed as part of the valence frame. So they are assumed to be something uh, additional and you can just um, put them wherever you want, but um, they are not part of the valence frames and they don't fill uh, slots that are used up. So be because of that, there can be as many adjuncts as you want to combine with a certain head. It's not, uh, adjuncts do not fill slots and um, yeah. Okay, so uh, for government and binding, it's assumed that there's some principle that's called the theta criterion. And um, that means that arguments are placed into certain positions in the clause, argument, argument positions, and then uh, the, the following has to hold. So each theta role is assigned to exactly one argument position and every phrase in an argument position receives exactly one theta role. So that means if you have a certain tree configuration uh, at the base structure, um, you, you will not, um, the, 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 it's somehow fixed where you can put your arguments in the tree uh, position and then you have to make sure that um, all the arguments are there. So there is not, not a position in the tree that is not filled or that you have uh, more um, more arguments than uh, the verb has theta roles or the predicate in general. Um, the arguments are ordered, so there are higher and lower ranked arguments, and uh, the highest ranked argument of verbs and uh, adjectives has a special status. It's uh, often not realized uh, in inside of a certain projection but outside, uh, so for instance, if you have um, English sentences, um, you have a verb phrase, so where verb and uh, object uh, combines uh, into a phrase, and then the subject is outside of that verb phrase. So therefore it's called the external argument. Um, the remaining arguments uh, occur in positions inside of the VP or AP, and the term is, uh, internal argument or complement. Yeah, for simple sentences, the external argument is the subject. There are three classes of theta rules. Um, so the class one is usually the, the highest rule, class three the lowest. And in class one, you have an agent, uh, the, the acting individual, the cause of an action or feeling, that's the stimulus, or the holder of a certain property. Uh, class two is the experiencer, for example, perceiving the perceiving individual, the person profit, profiting from something, beneficiary, or the opposite, um, the person affected by some kind of damage. Um, also, class two is a processor, so owner or soon to be owner of something, or the opposite, someone who has lost or is lacking something. And then we have class three, uh, the patient, affected person or thing uh, or a theme. So the problem with all that is, um, that it doesn't really work well. So if you want to do that for a non-trivial set of verbs, uh, you run into problems. And suggestions to, to fix that uh, involved something that, that is called, uh, called proto-roles, so that you say, you have certain criteria and say, okay, this is more like an agent, this is more like a patient, and um, if, if a certain 
argument of a verb fulfills more of these agent properties or has more of these agent properties than uh, patient proto properties, then it's a proto agent and otherwise it's a proto patient. So that's something that was uh, discussed, discussed by or suggested by David Doughty uh, in an article in Language. So Language is a top journal uh, of the Linguistic Society of uh, America. And um, I think that's a very good uh, paper. And it basically argues for collapsing these rules, uh, these, these, these um, labels for semantic roles. Okay, so let's have a look at one example, lexical item. Um, what do we need? Which information do we need uh, to use a word appropriately? So in the mental lexicon, we have lexical entries with specific properties of syntactic words uh, that, that are needed to use the word appropriately. So some of the information we need is listed here. So we need the, the form, so how it's, it is pronounced, right? Uh, the meaning, semantics. So that's, uh, if you remember your linguistics introduction for meaning pairs, that's arbitrary, right? So it's a conventional association between form and meaning, and uh, we have to learn that and store that in our memories. Then we have grammatical features, so like syntactic word class, part of speech, and morphosyntactic features like uh, tense or gender or something like that. And um, the theta grid, the semantic roles that are assigned by a verb. So that would be uh, a possible lexical item. The verb helfen, help, verb, verb stem. Um, the semantics is helfen prime. Um, uh, semantics is somehow um, yeah, often do that, that they just take the infinitival form and uh, add a prime to distinguish it from the written verb. So that's when they talk about um, the relation. So George Lakoff once made this uh, joke and it's great that the uh, lecture is in English now because it, the joke only works in English. So he said the meaning of life is life prime. Okay, I, <laughs> semanticists find that funny. Uh, me too. Okay, and uh, you have the, the theta grid with uh, theta roles like agent and beneficiary, and the agent is underlined because it's the uh, external argument. And then you have some uh, grammatical particularities, um, namely that the beneficiary gets a dative case, so that's something that is idiosyncratic, you have to learn that. Uh, we will come back to that, that's lexical case. So usually if you have two place verbs, then the second argument gets accusative, but if it doesn't, you have to learn that. Um, okay, so we have some more things to say um, about X-bar theory. So we already learned about X-bar uh, theory in the uh, previous lecture, but now we, we assume a certain version of X-bar theory and with some uh, further assumption. So first a comment on the uh, distribution of X-bar theory. It's not just uh, part of GB theory or Chomsky series in, in general. It's also part of lexical functional grammar or general trace structure grammar and some grammars for some languages of uh, uh, in, in HPC as well, heterogeneous trace structure grammar. Um, sometimes different categories are assumed in other frameworks. So um, in particular, functional categories like infill uh, have sometimes other names or are not assumed at all. And what is really important is that there is no assumption about universality of uh, um, X-bar theory, and it's not assumed that it's innate, um, which 
wouldn't make sense if you don't assume that it's universal. Um, so for instance, LFG has very special rules for uh, non-configurational languages like those spoken in Australia, um, where you can just, you don't have the constituents that we would assume for, for German or English. So parts of the NP can be mixed with, with other stuff. So the, the phrase structure rule in LFG for that is just an S uh, con, um, consists of some stuff. Right, so they, they don't care. And there are other uh, ways to uh, sort out the grammar of uh, languages like Volpiri. Okay, so XBAR theory uh, plays a role in government and binding, and we will look at um, how it's done in particular. So the next thing is heads. So again, you may stop the presentation here and think about uh, what a head is, uh, what you remember from the introductory lectures, maybe look it up in the book. Did you find it? Okay, so um, the head determines the most important properties of a phrase. Um, here you have some examples. Uh, Kim sleeps, Kim uh, likes Sandy in this house. Oops. The the, the adjective is too much here. Um, ein Haus, so here I assume that the noun is the head. That's a big discussion. Um, some people assume that the determiner is the head. Um, it doesn't matter at that point, but I decided to be consistent across the book and assume that the noun is the head. The, uh, the part of speech categories are divided into lexical categories and functional categories. And the lexical um, categories are roughly the, the open word classes. And we have five categories, verb, n, ad, noun, adjective, preposition, and adverb. And the interesting thing is that one can use a binary uh, classification with binary features. So we have the feature verb, like verbal, um, v, like verbal, uh, and it can have the value minus or plus, and we have the verb, uh, the feature n, and it can have the value minus or plus. So if we combine the possible values, we get four categories, right? So something that is not verbal and not nominal is a preposition. Something that is nominal and not verbal is obviously a noun. Something that is verbal and not nominal is a verb. And something that is both nominal and verbal is an adjective. That's quite cool because uh, if you think about adjectives, they can appear pre-nominal in, in German. And they have uh, the uh, the in inflection uh, there in the in the um, nominal um, uh, environment. They agree with a noun. And if you if you look at participles that that are somehow verbal, right? They can also be used as ad adjectives, like the, they are lachende or something with an adjectival inflection. Um, okay, so uh, we can have, we can formulate generalization. So we can say all plus verb things, we can refer them to them. And that these are either verbs or adjective, or we can say all plus n things. Um, so that's, what is it? plus n is noun or adjective. So we can say these can be a case, right? So as I just said, the, the nominal uh, domain uh, where determinant, adjective, and noun are agreeing in case and whereas other features. So remember something? We had we had five categories, right? So there was uh, there was adverbs in addition. So they are lacking here, but this is interesting because adverbs are just 
like prepositions, except that prepositions take an additional NP. And that can be said to be valence, right? So it's like a verb taking one or two arguments. Um, the preposition takes one argument and, uh, or a verb can also, well, verb can take one or two complements like objects and, uh, or, or none like an uh, intransitive verb and a preposition can take uh, an object or it can not take an object, right? So it's like an intransitive uh, preposition. So we don't need a, an additional uh, part of speech element here. Okay, so what can we do with this uh, uh, binary classification? So we can say, okay, but what, what people tried to do was uh, to make the head position dependent on the decomposed category. And that works for, for some cases. So nouns and prepositions are head initials. So you see that in 27 für Marie, a uh, Bild von Maria. Um, um, and adjectives and verbs are head final. Dem König treu, der dem Kind helfende Mann, dem Mann helfen. So that seems to work. But then, um, uh, so, we, so we can say uh, plus V is head final and minus V is head uh, initial, but um, it does not work for postpositions. So postpositions would be P, so minus verb, uh, but we have um, these examples here in German, das Geld deswegen die Nacht über, and that should be head initial according to this theory. Um, so what we could do is uh, that we say, okay, preposition is another part of speech and we need another binary feature. But then we would have three um, binary features and we would expect to have uh, eight categories in total uh, rather than four. And that's that doesn't seem to be a good idea. So um, maybe this binary encoding is not such a good idea after all, and we should think about different ways of doing that. Okay, then um, we have functional categories. They are not uh, cross-classified. Um, we have complementizers, uh, the, the I for finiteness, uh, and determiners, just these three uh, are discussed here. Um, and in addition to the treatment of lexical items, there are some further assumptions that are crucial for, for the things to come. So first it's assumed that all uh, phrases are endocentric. Um, Every phrase has a head and every head uh, is part of a phrase. Um, more technically, every head projects to a phrase. Um, this is interesting. So today one, one student asked um, whether phrase structure grammars come with claims regarding endocentricity. And pure phase structure grammars don't. I mean, you can write down whatever you want. Um, but uh, X bar and also minimalism uh, wants every phrase to have a head. But this is not so much a problem if you have empty elements around, right? So then you can uh, just stipulate that there is a head for a certain phrase and uh, assign some valence information to this head. And yeah, then, then you can combine stuff uh, where you would otherwise assume that it's not headed. Then there is uh, the assumption of binary branching uh, that was there in much of GB work already and in, in minimalism, there is really just binary branching.
And there is a non-tangling condition. That means that if you look at trees, that branches and trees may not cross. So um, if we look at early uh, grammars in, in genitive syntax, we had uh, rules like 81, um, where we have a, a, a sentence consisting of NP and VP. And then uh, in order to accommodate auxiliaries, um, there was a special note for the auxiliaries. In the very early liter literature, this could be expanded to, uh, to several auxiliaries also. Um, so if you look at this, you see that doesn't correspond to, exp to the expa frame. Um, so it, there is no head. So this, this is not an XP uh, and so it should, some, should be something verbal here, right? But that's not the case. Um, and this infill is totally off and it's not binary. And so, so these were the structures is assumed uh, back then. And then uh, Chomsky said, okay, that doesn't correspond to the XPA schema. B, let, let's do it that way. So rather than um, having this uh, infill node next to NP and VP, um, they assumed that there is an uh, I0 and that's combined with VP resulting in an I bar and then we get the subject and we get an IP. So that's perfectly a perfectly uniform uh, XPA structure. So we have it for, for the whole uh, grammar now. Um, this is something that was assumed for the for sentences without auxiliary and um, so Anne reads the newspaper. So here we have a, a, the no, no auxiliary but the inflectional affix. And then there are various theories how to deal with this situation because the affix is at the wrong position. It doesn't, uh, uh, cannot attach to, to, the, to the read. Um, so there were people saying, okay, the read moves up to the, to the affix. Um, the, then there were people arguing that the affix moves down to the verb. That's bad for theory internal reasons. People didn't want that. But uh, moving the, the verb makes also uh, wrong predictions for, uh, for adverb order and so on. So it's not even, not easy, even such a, a very central thing and something that should be straightforward is not trivial here. Um, what I would suggest uh, is not to assume that I uh, note at all. That works for German, certainly. Um, and in LFG, people did assume the, the I note for auxiliaries, but not for the affix. So the affix is, uh, in, in other series, it's just a part of the verbal inflection, and it's done in a morphology component, not here in the syntax. Okay, so as a last uh, things for today, we talk about C command, M command and government. Um, that's certain relations between nodes and, and trees. Um, it's assumed that case and uh, CETA rules are assigned under government. So that's a certain relation that has to be hold, has to hold between the verb and uh, the positions to which case is assigned. Um, and the the notion of government relies on uh, M command. Uh, C command is similar to M command. It's needed for the binding theory. I already mentioned it today. That's how pronouns, the reference of um, pronouns is restricted or determined. Um, and we will introduce both uh, notions, C command and M command, um, although we need 
only need m command for that part of the course. So the there are various versions uh, of c command and m command, which is sort of a problem because um, if authors assume different versions, their works and results are not compatible. So that in principle, there should be only one for each of the uh, terms. Okay, so what is C command? Uh, the popular formulation is uh, go upwards in the tree uh, and at the next possible uh, possibility, at the next possible branching, go downwards again. And upward uh, and, and M command means uh, go upwards and then downwards at any dominating node, uh, but not higher than the next XP. So I, I will discuss an example uh, of that uh, shortly. This uh, is the exact version. Um, the if here is uh, a shorthand for if and only if and you can read uh, and, and think about these definitions um, yeah, for yourself. I will just show the examples in the tree configuration. So this is a C command. Um, we have uh, the, the X here uh, in an X bar projection and x combined with a wp and the wp consists of internal uh, stuff um, again um, and the x c commands the wp and everything that is in there right so and m command is basically like c command but it so c command is just going one level up and then down but m command can go up uh, further and down again. Um, but the limit is here. So the next uh, phrasal projection is a limit. So m command cannot go any further. Okay. Based on m command, we can define government. Um, it's a structural relation between a head and a phrase. And we can say, okay, X governs YP if the following conditions hold simultaneously. Um, X is a lexical category, verb, noun, adjective, uh, preposition, or a finite uh, I. X has to M command YP, and uh, there is no barrier uh, between X and zero and YP. And what is a barrier depends on the language we are looking at. Um, if we simplify it, it's um, basically maximal projections are, uh, except y, IP. So we can look into uh, IPs to assign case there, but not into other things. Um, Yeah, so C makes sure that the head can assign neither case nor theta roles to parts of NP or PP and uh, restricts the government in depth. That's an example. So X can assign a theta role to WP, but uh, it cannot uh, reach something inside uh, the, the WP. So that's because that's a barrier, right? And we cannot go inside here. Okay, um, that's it for today. That was the basic uh, introduction to basic assumptions and, and the basic setting. And next time we will have a look at verb position and long distance dependencies. Thank you for your attention.